you argue that consciousness uh, could in fact be a fundamental feature of reality, which is of course a form of panpsychism. So could you talk a bit more about this form of panpsychism that you defend? Yeah, so the particular form I'm attracted to, and in fact, I mean, the reason why panpsychism that used to be laughed at for so long insofar as it was thought about at all, is now getting taken much more seriously in academic philosophy, is largely due to the rediscovery of really, really important work from the 1920s by uh, the philosopher and Nobel laureate uh, Bertrand Russell and the great scientist Arthur Eddington, who was incidentally the first scientist to experimentally confirm general relativity after the First World War. But I, I'm inclined to think these guys did in the 1920s for the science of consciousness, what Darwin did in the 19th century for the science of life. And I think it's a tragedy of history that for various historical reasons it got forgotten about. But it's in the last 10 or 15 years, it, it, it's getting rediscovered in, um, in academic philosophy and is causing a lot of excitement. And you know what I'm trying to do really is get this across to a broader audience. Philosophers are not, are not very good at reaching out to a broader audience in general. They just end up talking to themselves. So I really want to get this view out to a broader audience so that as, as a scientific community, we can start to fill in some of the details. So to come to the view itself, so Russell and Eddington's starting point really was that physical science tells you a lot less than you think about the nature of matter. So I think in, in the public mind, physical science is on its way to giving us this complete story of the nature of space and time and matter. But what Russell and Eddington realized is that it becomes apparent upon reflection that actually physical science is just confined to telling us about the behavior of matter, about what matter does. So if you think about what physics, what does, what does physics tell us about an electron? Physics tells us, for example, that an electron has mass and negative charge. What does physics tell us about these properties, mass and negative charge? Mass is characterized in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. Charge is, tra is characterized in terms of attraction and repulsion. So this all concerns the behavior of the electron, what it does. In fact, physics has absolutely nothing to say about what philosophers like to call the, the intrinsic nature of the electron, how the electron is in and of itself in, independently of its external behavior. So, so in fact, it turns out there's this huge gap in our scientific picture of the world. Physical science tells us a great deal about the behavior of matter, but it leaves us completely in the dark about the intrinsic nature of matter and space and time and fields and particles. So this is sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures. So what's this got to do with consciousness? I think um, the genius of Russell and Eddington was to bring together two problems that on the face of it have nothing to do with each other. On the one hand, the problem of consciousness, and the, and the other hand, the, the problem of intrinsic natures, and to see that they could be given a unified solution. So the problem of consciousness is roughly this challenge of finding a place for consciousness in our scientific theory of the world, our scientific worldview. The problem of intrinsic natures is that we have this huge hole in our scientific worldview. So the unified solution is roughly put consciousness in the hole, right? You're looking for a place for consciousness. You've got this hole, put consciousness in the hole. So, so the result is, as you say, a kind of panpsychism. But the view is, you know, there's just matter. There's just physical stuff, the subject matter of physical science, indeed. Um, nothing supernatural. But matter can be described from two perspectives. Physical science describes matter, as it were, from the outside. It tells us what it does, its behavior. But from the inside, in terms of its intrinsic nature, matter is constituted of forms of consciousness. So this is a beautifully simple, elegant, unified way of integrating consciousness into our scientific worldview. And it does so in a way that, unlike dualism, arguably, is, is completely consistent with everything we know about the body and the brain scientifically. So, so you know, I think this is a really, really powerful and uh, very much motivated worldview.
Right, so in this view that you're describing, the intrinsic nature of the world to which all of our physics and all of our equations point to is not provided in any way by by physics. But we may in fact have some access to it due to the intrinsic nature of our conscious minds. And so uh, consciousness in this view is an intrinsic nature. Could you say a bit more about why consciousness is an intrinsic nature and why it's also a good candidate for being the intrinsic nature of all reality? Yeah. So as you say, the view really is there's just physical stuff, but there's more to physical stuff than than physics tells us about or that physical science tells us about. Um, Physical science just tells us what it does, but tells us nothing about its intrinsic nature, how it is in and of itself. Now, you might you, you might accept that and you might be left with a kind of radical skepticism. You might think, oh, well, we just don't know anything about the intrinsic nature of the physical world. It's a complete mystery. Some modern Kantians have this kind of view. Uh, they, they, you know, they agree with this negative thesis that physical science doesn't really tell us what matter is in its intrinsic nature, but they just think, well, we can never know. But what Russell and Eddington thought is, well, actually, we do have one insight into the intrinsic nature of matter. We know that at least some of matter, namely our own brains, has a consciousness involving intrinsic nature. We know that because of our immediate awareness of our own conscious experience, our own feelings and experiences. And assuming that, I mean, if you're a dualist, then they are features of an immaterial soul. But it, if, if we suppose the falsity of dualism, then our conscious experience, our feelings and experiences are the intrinsic nature of a living, functioning brain. So actually, once you really absorb this starting point of this Russell and Eddington picture, it, it sort of turns the mind-body problem on its head. People usually think, oh, you know, the physical world and, and the brain is what we really understand. The trick is how to fit this mysterious thing, consciousness, in. But actually, if Russell and Eddington were right, the one thing we know about reality is that some matter, namely functioning brains, have a consciousness involving intrinsic nature. Once you've really absorbed this this Russell Eddington starting point, I've argued that the most simple, elegant speculation is that matter outside of brains as a nature that's continuous with matter inside of brains and also having a consciousness involving nature. You know, to put it another way, you'd need a reason to suppose that matter has two kinds of intrinsic nature, consciousness intrinsic nature and non-consciousness intrinsic nature, rather than the more parsimonious proposal that it just has one kind of intrinsic nature. But once you're in the mindset of thinking that physics gives us a complete story of physical reality, you know, then panpsychism is absurd because Physics doesn't seem to be telling us that electrons are conscious. But once you've really absorbed this view that physical science tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of matter, and that the only thing we know is that some physical entities have a consciousness involving intrinsic nature, panpsychism starts to look much more probable. I think for for panpsychism to be plausible, there does need to be some reason for why we should expect something like consciousness or mentality to exist fundamentally at the ground floor of reality. And I think this is why the view that you're defending is is very interesting and attractive, because it does seem to frame uh, physics as requiring something very much like consciousness. There's this sort of outer, objective description of the world which science uh, provides very well. Uh, But that description arguably also implies a, a grounding interior dimension of that reality, what it is in itself. And consciousness is uh, not only the only intrinsic nature that we know of, uh, but it also seems to be exactly the sort of thing that we need to to fill this gap. Yeah, absolutely. I guess there are two reasons to postulate consciousness at this fundamental level. I mean, one is the hope ultimately of giving an an explanation, uh, an account of human and animal consciousness. Right? We've We've tried for decades now to explain consciousness in terms of non-consciousness, and we've got precisely nowhere. I mean, neuroscience has provided 
lots of extraordinary data that a, that a science of consciousness needs to take seriously. But on that central question of trying to solve the hard problem, of trying to explain why consciousness exists at all, materialism, I think, has, has got precisely nowhere. So this is proposing a, an alternative research program rather than try and explain consciousness in terms of non-consciousness, we try to explain complex forms of consciousness, the consciousness of humans and animals, in terms of simpler forms of consciousness, simple forms of consciousness that are then postulated to exist as basic constituents of matter. And, you know, in fact, there's, there's plenty of precedent in science for non-reductive explanations. If we think, for example, uh, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, Maxwell in the 19th century he didn't explain electricity and magnetism in terms of mechanistic properties and laws that science was already committed to. Rather, he postulated new electromagnetic properties and forces and explained electromagnetism on that basis. So the hope of the panpsychist, you know, and it's early days in any theory of consciousness, but the hope of the panpsychist is that when the theory of co final theory of consciousness eventually comes along, the thought is it won't explain consciousness in terms of non-consciousness. I think it's a prejudice of materialists to suppose that's what we have to do. It will rather explain complex forms of consciousness in terms of simpler forms of consciousness, simple forms of consciousness which are then taken as basic. So that, that that's one important reason. The other is, as you've already alluded to, actually physical science doesn't give us a complete account even of inanimate matter, even of electrons, you know, even forgetting consciousness for the moment, it doesn't give us a complete account of what, what a quark is. It tells us what a quark does, it doesn't tell us what it is. Uh, and panpsychists have a positive proposal as to, uh, at least in broad brushstrokes, the intrinsic nature of, of basic matter, one that is, is, is continuous with the only thing we really know about the intrinsic nature of matter, which is that some of it involves consciousness. So if this uh, species of, of panpsychism that you're describing is, is correct, consciousness would be the uh, intrinsic nature of matter. So we have a real physical world, as you describe, but in a way it's uh, made of consciousness. And uh, Arthur Reddington, I believe, once said that the, uh, the stuff of the world is mind stuff. Uh, so, I mean, as far as I can tell, this view is not that far from idealism. So for you, what would you say is the distinction here between panpsychism and idealism at this level? I would say that, that they are overlapping views, panpsychism and idealism. So if you imagine a kind of Venn diagram, there is an overlapping bit where there are views that are both panpsychism and idealism, but there are also views that are panpsychist and not idealist, and views that are idealist and not panpsychist. So that the panpsychist thinks that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of reality, but they might think there are also non-mental aspects to basic matter. So they might think, you know, quarks have very basic mental properties, but they might also have non-mental properties. And then that wouldn't be a form of idealism, because the idealist thinks that the basic fundamental nature of reality is purely mental. A panpsychist might think that, and then they'd be a, an idealist of a kind, but they might, they might deny that. It's not true by definition that a panpsychist is an idealist. Conversely, you have forms of idealism uh, like Berkeleyan idealism, the view of George Berkeley, the great 18th century idealist, where the physical world is not fundamental. So for Berkeley, a table, a physical table, is a collection of ideas, either in our mind or in the mind of God. A lot of people interpret that as meaning, oh, well, the physical world doesn't really exist. But actually, Berkeley would question that. He thinks the physical world exists, but it's not fundamental. The, the physical world is a, is a construction out of human minds. So I think that's inconsistent with panpsychism, because the panpsychist thinks the physical world is fundamental. They believe in the hard physical world out there. They just think it's, it involves consciousness. It's, it's, it can be a form of idealism, but it's quite, in some ways, quite close to materialism. Both the materialist and the panpsychist think, you know, I'm looking at a table in front of me now, right now. Uh, the table is really out there, you know, outside of my perception of it. Berkeley would disagree with that. Berkeley would think, no, no, the, the table is just, 
exists in my mind. Whereas the, the panpsychism materialist think the table is really out there independently of my mind. It's just that it's made up of little conscious things. So yeah, so they're, they're, they're importantly related views, but there are also f- ways in which they can come apart. Philip, how do you respond to people who just recoil at the weirdness of panpsychism? It's, it seems to have this slightly hippie, new age vibe about it. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, it is getting taken much more seriously, but very much in academic philosophy and also to an extent in neuroscience because of the interest in Giulio Tononi's integrated information theory, which has panpsychist implications. But there are still some people who just can't stand these kind of, um, as you say, hippie connotations in scare quotes. My view is, look, we should judge a view not by its cultural connotations, but by its explanatory power. And what panpsychism offers us is, is, is a way of integrating consciousness into our scientific worldview in a way that's completely consistent with everything we know scientifically. That's a huge theoretical plus. And, and to my mind, the, the, the the, the idea that it always feels a bit weird doesn't doesn't really count for much. I mean, I've started to think much more, actually. Terms like New Age are, are sort of a term of abuse, maybe a little bit akin to racist terms, that they, you know, they capture a, a range of views in terms of their content, but they also have this implication that, you know, you sort of fluffy-minded and not really thought it through seriously, and so we can just dismiss them quite quickly. And, of course, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there there is a lot of such views that that, that are defended non rigorously, you know, as there are in in materialist views as well. But there are also there's no reason why you can't uh, defend these kind of views with 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 academic seriousness and with with, with scientific and philosophical rigor. So you know, I really think there is, there is. I'm not saying there's a, there's a deliberate conspiracy here, but there is perhaps partly in reaction to the, you know, certain movements in the 60s, there is a a kind of way in which this these terms are loaded to allow us to dismiss and ignore certain views. Yeah, maybe I could just take a moment to to connect this panpsychist sort of view of reality that you're talking about with the, the larger story that science gives us about ourselves in the universe. Because Arguably, the, the progress of science has continually challenged any sense of our significance or our centrality in the universe. And, you know, we now know that we're not really the center of anything. We're not fundamentally different to animals. And, you know, we zoom out and all in all, we appear to have a very peripheral place in reality. As Stephen Hawking described us as a, a chemical scum uh, smeared across the surface of the planet, But the view that you and other panpsychists are describing, I think, kind of goes against that narrative in a way, because if consciousness is not an illusion and our minds are, in fact, continuous with reality's evolving mental aspect, not so much in our identity as humans, maybe, but as our identity as conscious beings, we do reflect a very deep and and significant part of reality. And you know, we really are the universe becoming aware and experiencing itself. And as far as I can tell, that really changes things and our maybe our orientation to the rest of the universe. Yeah, I mean, so I think when we're doing science or we're doing philosophy, we we should certainly be thinking about not which view we'd like to be true, but which view is most likely to be true. And I think that there there is a, a very good case for panpsychism as the best the best account of how consciousness fits into our scientific worldview. Nonetheless, it's also interesting to think about the the implications of a view for the meaning of human existence and human happiness. My new book, you know, most of it, the first four chapters are dealing with this this reality question, what what view is most likely to be true and building a scientific and philosophical case for panpsychism. But in the final chapter, I get on to think, well, what implications, if if any, does, does this view have for human meaning and human existence. And I am inclined to think that panpsychism, as well as being um, probably true, is is slightly better for our um, mental and spiritual health. You know, materialism is a pretty dismal worldview. You know, you've got a, an essentially mechanistic picture of nature. And, uh, you know, then you've got the cold immensity of empty space. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty bleak. 
Whereas in a panpsychist worldview, this is this is a we are conscious creatures in a conscious universe. This is a universe we fit into, um, a universe where we can perhaps feel a little bit more comfortable in our own skin. So I think this is in some way a, a little bit more attractive picture of, of reality. Also, I think perhaps it can allow for a better relationship to the environment. You know, the ter- we're going through terrible environmental crisis right now. If you're a materialist and you think plants and trees are, are mechanisms, essentially, are non-conscious mechanisms, then really you're going to think of the value of, of plants and trees indirectly in terms of the effect it has on us conscious creatures, you know, either looking pretty or, or more importantly, sustaining our existence. But if you're a panpsychist and if you think plants and trees are conscious, then then, then a tree is, is a locus of moral importance in its own right. Chopping down a tree is, is an act of immediate moral significance. So I think this is, is transformative of, of our relationship with nature and encourages a very different relationship, I think, with the natural world. Yeah, and you contrasted panpsychism with a mechanistic view of reality. And I think panpsychism, importantly, is also a more organismic view of the universe. If if consciousness plays a deep role in reality, that's alive to me. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that definition. And so for me, the idea of an organism is a, a much more resonant metaphor for the universe than a machine. I don't know if you uh, agree with that, but do you think panpsychism is, in a sense, a, a kind of return to a more enchanted scientific animism? Yeah, I mean, I think these are, to, to an extent, as I think you'd agree, metaphors or analogies, ways of ways of thinking of, of of nature or reality rather than actually the bare bones of the view itself but yeah I, you're perhaps right that that thinking in ter- in organic terms of of the universe more generally is perhaps a more apt metaphor and, and one that is slightly more consonant with with human happiness <laughs> 